court. And the devotees yesterday are were eager to hear more about the Acharyas. Did I use his disappearance? Om Gyan Timiranda Syang Gyana Jana Salakaya Jaksu Unnamita Mirina Tasmai Shri Guru Gyana Maha Shri Jaitanya Mano Vistam Stakita Mirina Bhutavai Swayam Rupa Kidam Mayam Tadati Swapadati Gam Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Kristaya Bhutale Shri Makti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Iti Namine Namaste Saraswati Deve Gaula Mari Gacharine Nirvishesa Sunyavari Pastyatya De Satarine Panchakalpa Tarubis Cha Kripa Sindhu Beva Cha Patitanam Bhavane Vyo Vaishnave Vyo Namaho Namaha Jai Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadhar Sivasadi Gaur Bhakta Vrindam Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare <clears throat> So uh, one of the main activities of the Vaishnavas is to, or might, you might even say the main activity of the Vaishnavas is to honor great souls. <laughs> it is also mentioned, and it's also mentioned by Krishna himself, that one who glorifies his pure devotees, he finds more pleasure in that than here receiving his own glorification. And this is important to keep in mind so we can keep this in practice. The Lord is great and his greatness is understood in unlimited ways. But what the Lord is most pleased with is when we glorify those who have taken shelter of him and have become truly great in their service and in their contribution to propagate and to proliferate Vaishnav culture, Vaishnav teachings, Vaishnav behavior. So today is one great soul Prabhupada talks about him in different lectures with Sri Lochandas Thakur. Not so much known about Lochandas Thakur, but one thing that is outstanding in our day-to-day -day awareness of his contribution is his Chaitanya Mangala. There are three, maybe four, but we might say three plus another main uh, scriptures or delineations of the teachings and pastimes of Lord Chaitanya. And of course, the king of it all is Chaitanya Bhagavat by Vrindavan Das Thakur, who's called the father of Lord Chaitanya's pastimes. And then, of course, we are very much connected with, through the grace of Srila Prabhupada, Krishna Das Kaviraj Goswami's presentation of Chaitanya Charitamrita, which is full of the narrations of Lord Chaitanya's pastimes. But what's unique in relationship to Krishna, uh, to Vrindavan Das Thakur's pastime presentation in the form of Chaitanya Bhagavat is that in Krishna Das Kaviraj Goswami there is much scriptural evidence to support what he says as opposed, not opposed, but in relationship or in, in comparison with Chaitanya Bhagavat, which is more extensive in its narration. Chaitanya Bhagavat is much longer than Chaitanya Charitamrita. 
although both are quite lengthy. But Chaitanya Bhagavad is mostly all Leela. And Tattva is hardly there, although the Tattva is mixed in with the Leela. We're in Chaitanya Charitamrita, we have the Leela and the, uh, and the uh, Tattva presented in sequence. So there is many, many verses in Chaitanya Charitamrita that are from Srimad Bhagavatam and other Puranas, but mostly Srimad Bhagavatam. Lochan Das Thakur has derived his presentation from the notes of Marari Gupta, who took extensive notes along with uh, Raghunath Das Goswami, Srupdhamadar Goswami, on the activities of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So Marari Gupta has also written, which is also presented, uh, it's called uh, uh, Marari Charita, Charita, C-A-R-I-T-A. And that is also the activities of Lord Chaitanya. Um, it's not in book form, it's in manuscript form. I don't think it has made it to a full publication yet. But it's also interesting. All the pastimes and activities of Lord Chaitanya are full of nectar, sweet nectar, and the messages of the execution of devotional service. So today we'll speak a little bit about Lochan Das Thakur. Of course, we mentioned his book, um, Chaitanya Mangala. Actually, Vrindavan Das Thakur's work Chaitanya Bhagavat was initially called Chaitanya Mangala, but then he changed it to Chaitanya Bhagavat. Um, I'm not sure of the chronological connections between these different scriptures. I think Krishna Das Kaviraj Goswami, <coughs> he wrote his after Chaitanya Bhagavat. That's, that's very much understood even within the book itself because he gives a lot of reference to um, Chaitanya Bhagavat in relationship to his narrations, not wanting to uh, make his book too long, saying that Vrindavan Das Thakur has already covered the subject. But you see in certain subjects that are covered extensively in Lord Chaitanya's pastimes with, in each of these scriptures, one particular pastime may be covered more extensively. For instance, in Chaitanya Mangala, you find the wedding of Lord Chaitanya and Vishnu Priya is given much, much attention, page after page after page. And uh, what we have, we don't have the book in the verse form, but we have it in the, uh, what we say, in the narration. The verses have been connected into a story form. So in that story from you'll find that there's a lot of details on Lord Chaitanya's marriage to Vishnu Priya, where it's hardly mentioned in Chaitanya Charitamrita. In Chaitanya Charitamrita, Lord uh, Krishna Das Kaviraj mentions, and he gives some, some extension, some extensive explanation of uh, the uh, march on Chankazi's house, civil disobedience arranged by Lord Chaitanya, when, when Chankazi wanted to stop the Sankirtan movement, and he sent his uh, soldiers to harass the devotees and threaten them. He also broke the drums. When Lord Chaitanya found out, he became like Lord Vishringadev, and he, then he organized uh, Harinam Sankirtan in such a way that millions of persons, nobody knew even where they came from. Many said they came from higher planets and from everywhere in the universe to take part in Lord Chaitanya's march. So that particular pastime is fully narrated in Chaitanya Bhagavad, where there is 745 verses, I think. That's approximately the number on that particular Leela, which is really an interesting Leela. For those who are interested in that particular Leela, and I think it's very much relevant 
to understand that in relationship to the present situation in the world, the importance of Harinam Sankirtan. Um, and we're going to take that up as a sequence of uh, classes, maybe within a week or so, maybe a little bit longer. I'm not sure exactly. I haven't chosen a date yet, but that's on the list to narrate that particular pastime. And it's the most incredible and the most full of amazing events that happened in that particular uh, Leela, uh, Krishna Das Kaviraj Goswami's Chaitanya Charitamrita doesn't give the extensive details, but in Chaitanya Bhagavad is nicely and elaborately um, explained. All right, so now we'll begin a little bit about Lochan Das Thakur. And um, it's interesting, he was born in the year 1523. And that was, um, Lord Chaitanya had, was already at that time, um, 30, 37 years old. And he was born in the area of Katwa near the Burdon district. Um, it's, made, it's interesting. Let's see, his mother was named Sadanandi, and he studied at his maternal grandfather's house. And even from his early childhood, he displayed amazing devotion to Lord Chaitanya. He was married at a very early age, and his wife was like a child when he married. You'll see that in Vedic culture. In order to protect the girl from being exploited by her development in age because uh, as a girl develops she develops puberty and at that time she becomes very uh, aware of her her feminine uh, nature so before that develops or by that time that develops the vedic culture wants that the girl become protected from being exploited either by herself or by outside so child, so a lot of times marriages were done very early. Prabhupada tells about his own sister. She was 12 years old and she was not married at the time. <laughs> and no, I think it was his, uh, his cousin. Yeah, his cousin. And the mother of the daughter, she was complaining to the husband you know, she's 12 and you're not, you know, you haven't found a husband for her, her yet. And so he was being chastised and she was getting all upset. So this is actually culture uh, where that way the girl, when she's married and she knows only one person in life, she becomes very much dedicated to that person and her chastity is stronger and her devotion to that person and her service becomes very, very, what we say, surrounded by all forms of chastity and allegiance to her husband. And the marriage becomes good, becomes strong in the early time. So Lochan Das Dakur was married at a very early age so much so that he could not live with his wife at the time because she was just a child. So she remained at her parents' house. <clears throat> During that time, he became interested in learning more and more about Lord Chaitanya, although he was married. And he uh, decided to associate with great souls. So in that association, <clears throat> he really went deep and during that time, he took initiation from his spiritual master, Narahari Sakar, which is interesting because we all heard of Narahari uh, in the Gore Arti ceremony. There's one uh, particular line that we sing, Nara Hari Hari Pori Chamura Dulaya. Nalahari was a very intimate associate of Lord Chaitanya, so much so that we hear 
and we hear quite often how Lord Chaitanya was very, would become very upset when people would refer to him as a Supreme Lord. Many times he would block his ears or he would respond in, uh, in defiance of that. But when Narahari would say it, the Lord would not say anything. That's the intimacy of that relationship. So Narahari became the uh, guru of Lochan Das, and he took initiation from Narahari. Um, and then he left, and it was for many, many years. Um, his wife was about 10 years old when she got married, and he was a little older, and at that time, he just spent time with his spiritual master and with other souls, just hearing and chanting the glories of the Lord. After some time, the parents of the girl were a little concerned that the husband of their daughter was not around. So now she had become much older when she had been grown up. So they wanted Lochan Das to come back and take the responsibility of, you know, the marriage. So he wasn't interested. He, went, he didn't have much of an interest, but Narahari Sakur was alerted to what the situation was by the parents of the girl. And so he said to his disciple, you should go back and meet your wife and live in Grihasta life. <clears throat> so a dutiful disciple of his spiritual master, he accepted the instruction and went to the village where his wife well, he has told his wife was living. This is how long it had been since he had it. And then he was looking around for the house that she was living in. He saw some lady in the area by a well. From the well. Hmm. Yeah. Close you. Close your thing, Brajananda. Mm -hmm. Brajananda, yeah, okay. He saw some lady drawing water from the well. So he went up to her and inquired about the house of his wife. She was a little embarrassed and then she indicated where that house was. Later on, he found out that that lady who was drawing water from the well was his wife, <laughs> although he didn't recognize her. <laughs> she had grown and he had been away so long. So when he approached her and asked, he referred to her as mother, which is a respectable term that is given in Vedic etiquette to ladies. Prabhupada talks about this terminology mother in his lectures. And he says, uh, a man should refer to all women except his wife as mother. And therefore that is a, an honorary respect. Sometimes we see in Western countries who are devotees in our Krishna conscious movement um, there you feel a little uncomfortable or sometimes even averse to being called mother. <laughs> it's an endearing term. It's a term of affection. It's a term of respect. And it's something that Prabhupada uh, very much mentioned in his lectures that the men in our society should carefully follow that. And then he explained in detail how that term applies. He says that not only applies to women who are older, but all women, even one who is younger, she is referred to as mother. He said, not bagini. Bagini means sister, <laughs> like that. You'll see in some cultures, they refer to ladies as sisters, you know. But then Prabhupada said, no, that is not Vedic culture. 
And then one lady, and you could hear it on the tape, she was listening and she was there in Prabhupada's presence when he was speaking about that. So then she asked, Srila Prabhupada, okay, then the men should refer to us women as mother, but what about us women? How do we address the men? And then Prabhupada said, son, son. So that keeps the relationship at least in the verbal etiquette, away from getting what we say down to the uh, sensual platform or familiar, overly familiar platform where wrong types of mentalities can develop. So that's interesting that Prabhupada said that in relationship to women referring to men as son. So he called his wife, Lochan Das, not knowing it was his wife referring to this lady as mother. But then when he again was united with her, he found out that that was the lady who was, was his wife. He referred to her as mother. <laughs> and you don't do that with your wife. It's only done for, from ladies who are not your wife. And so um, it became an awkward situation. He had this reverence towards his wife in the form of respecting her as a mother. She could see that his, uh, his um, duty in household life was not there within his mind and heart. He was not really interested in Grihasta life at that time. He had developed a real sense of detachment from that. And she could see that. And of course, he stayed within the marriage because of his instructions by his guru. But she noted it and she said, uh, I can understand your mind and heart, so therefore you may go and execute your devotional life. So he took that as a clue and he did and left his married life. And then of course, you know, he became very much interested in writing and he wrote many, many songs. Some of the songs we are familiar with. He liked to glorify his guru Narahari very much. But he had a feeling that he had uh, neglected glorifying Lord Nityananda. So therefore, in order to over what we say to uh, compensate for his feelings of not glorifying Lord Nityananda, because he wrote many, many, many passages in glorification of uh, of um, Har Narahari. He said, Narahari Thakur is the proprietor of my life and out of hope of attaining his lotus feet, I desire to sing the glories of Garanga, even though I am the lowest of the low. This is my ambition. Another one, I offer my reverences to Narahari Das, the ocean of Garanga's qualities. Other than him, I have no friend in the three worlds. Also in the same stotra. My Lord and Master is Narhari Das. I prostrate myself in humility to him. May he fulfill my desires. And he was also glorifying um, Krishna Das Kaviraj and Vrindavan Das Thakur. He wrote his Chaitanya Mangala in the year 1537. Mm -hmm. Um, and there's much more on it. In order to uh, feel he was honoring Lord Nityananda nicely, he wrote many songs. One is called Nitai Golamani. It's a beautiful song. Gora, Nitai Goramani means the jewel. Nitai, the jewel of Lord Chaitanya. Nitai Gora Mani, Ama Nitai Gora Mani. 
Aniya Prema Nabandya Basala Avani. Beautiful, beautiful song. Nittai is a jewel of virtue. Nittai is a jewel of virtue. He brought the deluge of love of God and flooded the world. Nittai brought the deluge of love of God to Gaudiya Darshan and inundated the devotees. The lowly and depraved were also washed away in the flood. Nittai never excluded the lowly and deprived, nor the sinful and atheistic. He insisted everyone take the gift of love, which is beyond the reach of even the gods like Brahman. Nittai released the floodgates that held back the ocean of compassion, going from door to door to give everyone the nectar of divine love. Rochanda says that anyone who has not worshipped Nittai has knowingly committed suicide mm -hmm. and that's the some that's the translation from that song song Nittai Gormani. another song which is very much um, sung by the Vaishnavas which is not uh, so much known but it's it's known to some degree is uh, a song uh, Akroda Paramananda Nityananda Roy Abhimana Sunna Nittai Nagori Berai Akroda Paramananda Completely free from anger, Lord Nityananda is the embodiment of supreme joy. He wanders throughout the town without any pride or arrogance. He knocks on every fallen soul's door and bestows the maha mantra of the holy names upon them. Placing, placing straw between his teeth, he says to everyone, worship Gorhari and you will purchase me and make me your slave. Then he falls on the ground in ecstasy, looking like a golden mountain rolling in the dust. Whoever lacks faith in such a compassionate incarnation is a sinner who will have to die having made nothing of his life, says Lochan Das. Mm -hmm. That's also a beautiful, beautiful song. Akroda Paramananda Nityananda. Kroda means anger, and Akroda means one who is completely free from anger. Although he was beaten by uh, by Madai being hit in the head with a pot, he never became angry. He just tolerated it and gave Madai his mercy in the form of devotion to Lord Chaitanya. And of course, a beautiful stone. We all know, we all sing. It's one of the favorite of the Vaishnavas. Shri Gaur Nityanandir Doi. And I'll sing some of the lines. Parama Karuna Bahudui Janai Nitai Golachandra Sabayavatara Sadosiromane Kevalayananda Kandra Baja Baja Bai Chaitanya Nitai Sudida Vishnavas Kari Vishaya Charia Se Rasa Majia Mukha Bole Huri Huri. Now, this is a beautiful song and goes on. Uh, these two lords, Nitai and Gorachandra, are most compassionate of all the incarnations of the Godhead. They are most perfect and they are the unique source of joy. Pray, O oh brothers, pray with the great faith to Chaitanya Nittai. Give up all forms of sense gratification. Absorb yourself in the flavor of divine mood and use your tongue to sing the names of Sri Hari. And he goes on. So this, of course, this beautiful song is, is a favorite of the Gaudiya Vaishnavas and of course, the ISKCON Society has adopted it as one of the main songs when the devotees come together and do Gaur Bhajan. Well, these are some of the uh, beautiful songs. Um, 
given by Lochantas Thakur. I would encourage everyone to sing these songs regularly, at least his last one, Nitai Parama Karuna Bahudui Jani, Nitai Golachandra, Sabayavatar Sadosiromani, Kevalayanandakanda. These songs will charm the heart and they are as good as chanting of the holy names of the Lord. And of course, we would encourage the devotees to take time and read Chaitanya Mangala. It's not so long. It's available within the ISKCON Society. You can find it in some of the book outlets that we have. And it's a beautiful book. Those of you who like to read about marriages, <laughs> this is really the book for you. <laughs> It's a grand explanation of Lord Chaitanya's marriage with Vishnu Priya. It covers many, many, many pages. <clears throat> and of course, many of the other pastimes there in more sutra form, not so extensive, but they're there. There's one thing about Chaitanya Mangala that is mentioned it refers to um, how Chaitanya Mahaprabhu actually took the form, I mean, I'm sorry, Lord Krishna actually took the form of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. What led up to that in the pastime, as far as I can remember, is that Lord Chaitanya was traveling, I mean, Krishna came to see his foremost queen, Mother Rukmini in Dwarka, when Krishna was in Dwarka. And um, he accepted her service and she was massaging his lotus feet. And she was becoming so overwhelmed with emotion, massaging the lotus feet of Lord Krishna that she started to express her feelings by saying, uh, you don't know how wonderful your lotus feet are. And then of course, she kept repeating this phrase over and over again. Finally, when Krishna was thinking, oh, I don't know how wonderful my lotus feet are. But then, but Mini said something which really brought the whole pastime to fruition. And she said, but there is one person, only one, who knows how wonderful your lotus feet are. And that person is Srimati Radharani. When Dwarkadish Krishna, staying in Dwarka, heard that. It said that he became thoughtful. And then, based on this particular pastime, it says, of course, these leelas are eternal. So we're just explaining the eternal within the principle of time sequence. But what he then, the Lord Chaitanya thought, I mean, Lord Krishna thought, I have to find out how wonderful my lotus feet are, but how can I do that? That's not possible for my own position. I must take the position of Srimati Radharani. So that particular pastime heralds the appearance of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, who was Sri Krishna Chaitanya Radha Krishna Nahi Anya. Radha and Krishna have become one in Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. He is Krishna who is endowed with the mood of Srimati Radharani, the bhakti, the bhava of Srimati Radharani. So that's mentioned, I believe, towards the very beginning of Chaitanya Mangala. Okay, so uh, we'll conclude here and see if there's any discussion.
or any comments? Thank you so so much guru maharaj for the wonderful uh, session on this uh, i'm sorry i have to say thank you for because this was really useful and uh, we need to know all the acharyas so uh, devotees if you have any questions comments reflections please um, uh, you can unmute yourself and ask or either you can type in the chat box Maybe we'll find hard find it hard to ask questions based on this presentation. But if you have any comments that you'd like to express, that is more than welcomed. Please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. All glories to you, Guru Maharaj. Would you please share with us when uh, that particular lecture? where Srila Prabhupada is explaining the glorious position of uh, women as mothers and uh, that particular conversation with that lady and so on. You have to check the database and you just have to do a uh, Google search through the ISKCON database. Do you have the database? Yes, Guru Maharaj. Yeah. And just look, you know, you just look for some of the key words, like, uh, I don't know, I remember hearing it at least two or three times, but I didn't make any notation. We have Manisha, she has her hand raised. Does she know the answer to this one? Hare Krishna, Dandavan Purnam, Guru Maharaj, all devotees, my humble obeisances. Um, no, I have a question. Um, wait, a minute, question wait, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute, Manisha. I haven't, okay. haven't finished with Sri Devi yet. We thought you were going to add to the information. Just give me one minute and I'll have to finish with Sri Devi. And then you can speak. Um, yeah, so uh, it's... Um, it's one of his Prabhupada's earlier lectures. Um, so I would think uh, uh, you could look for the word sun. Um, just try to find a combination of some words that would be Prabhupada's response to that question. She asked Prabhupada, how should women see men, view men, refer to men like that? So just, just play around with some words until you can connect with the actual, and then find it in the database. Yes, of course, Guru Maharaj. Thank you so much. Okay, uh, Manisha, please uh, say something. Okay, thank you so much, Guru Maharaj. Sorry about that, Mataji. So my question, I just really, really love this explanation and um, thank, thank you so much for giving this ex explanation today. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm not supposed to say thank you. Um, but my question is that um, about like, okay, so for as a female referring to all male devotees as Prabhuji. Can you please explain about that? What's, what's the explanation? It's already obvious. <laughs> so like, like my biological brother, right? By my body, like uh, I'm supposed to call him Prabhuji too. And my father also Prabhuji too. Uh... Family members, no, that, that, that within the family, like we said, the wife, the husband doesn't call the wife mother. And the wife, the wife refers to the husband as Prabhu. Yes, that I agree 110% because like a, for, for me, like my husband is like a God, right? Like I... Oh, you refer husband. to him as Prabhu, and men right. are the men are supposed to call their wife Devi. 
Mm -hmm. But like uh, other other male devotees, then how I can give them yeah, also? Yeah, yes, we, 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 we just, yeah, just call him Prabhu, not Prabhu G. Oh, okay. Yes, just Prabhu. That G doesn't ref, doesn't really fit. That's something that I don't know. People have attached to everything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's just Prabhu. You refer, yeah, you just say Prabhu. Prabhu simply means that you are requesting service. So therefore, when you request service, then it's a master. So Prabhu means master. It's the etiquette. Mm -hmm. and, again, and you'll always be safe using that terminology. Mm -hmm. Thank you so Sometimes much. I also mention the name along with, I, in your husband, you don't refer to the name, but you can, an outside person, you can use their name along with Prabhu. Yeah, but then, you know, in the, growing up in the American culture, <laughs> my husband, then he has a problem if I call him, like, not, if I don't call him by name. So <laughs> what to do with that? <laughs> Uh, you have to work that out. I'm not, I'm not, I can't say anything about that. Okay, but thank you again, Guru Maharaj. Hari Bo. Hare Krishna Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. <clears throat> all glories to Srila Prabhupada, all glories to you, Maharaj. Maharaj, thank you very much uh, for uh, this presentation on Lochandas Thakur. Uh, in fact, it's in the calendar, but I completely missed it. Today is his appearance day. So thank you uh, for the presentation. <clears throat> it's just a comment rather than a question, as, uh, as you mentioned, that he has mentioned a lot about the, uh, the married life of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And... Uh, it is something that I would want, uh, well, at least <clears throat> uh, for, for myself, read it because when I read the Chaitanya Charitamrita, there is very few references to his married life. Uh, so oh, this uh, is, it's not the married life; it's the wedding. Oh, it's a wedding. Yeah, no, it's the detailed explanation of the wedding. Ah, okay, okay. <clears throat> it's not in this married life. You, you, you won't find a lot anywhere. Because it's not the main part. It's just a, it's just a transitional stage that we know him through. Okay. He was, he was married to Lakshmi Priya at first, and then when he went to West, when he went to East Bengal at the time, and then he came back. And Sachi Mata we, uh, said that Lakshmi Priya had been bitten, bitten by the snake of separation, and therefore she she departed from the planet. And then Sachi Mata was concerned that he get married again. And so she met this one a matchmaker named Banamali Pandit. And Banamali, Banamali Pandit arranged for um, the marriage of Vishnu Priya and uh, Lord Chaitanya. And then he was married until he took sannyas. When he took sannyas, he, there is, it's a beautiful story how he, he removed himself from the association of his wife and his mother. Of course, his wife, he had completely, but then he was concerned about his wife after he left her. He didn't simply leave her and just go. He, um, he, he commissioned one of his followers, whose name was Vamsi Das, to make a deity of himself. And that deity is still there in a place called Koladweep. It's, um, and you can go there, it's one of the most famous deities of Lord Chaitanya. Um, look, he is standing, he's a big deity, he's standing with his uh, arms straight forward, with his two hands upward, and he's giving complete mercy. So Vishnu Priya worshipped that deity until she left the planet. She, she lived till 96 years old. And when he left, she was just a teenager. She was around, I don't know, 18 years old, 16, something like that. So her whole life, 
she uh, worshipped the Lord in that deity form, and that deity is none different than Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Devotees go, when they go to Koladweep, they immediately go to that temple to take darshan of that deity. It's, it's called Dameshwara Mahadev. Yeah, Dameshwara. Yeah. Um, it's a beautiful, beautiful, smiling, huge smile on Lord Chaitanya's face with hands outwardly stretched, giving so much mercy. Um, she worshipped that deity her whole life. And um, she lived pretty much alone. And she, was, she stayed with Sachimata until Sachimata disappeared. And she was assisted by one person called Ishan. Ishan was somewhat a personal assistant that took care of her personal needs. Every day, she would chant the holy names of the Lord. And every time she would finish one round, she'd take one grain of rice and put it in a, in a, on the side and then at the end of the day after chanting so many rounds she would have a, a small pile of rice and then she would cook that and that's all she ate and she followed that her whole life so in her mood of separation she uh, was just chanting the holy names worshipping the Lord in, in the form of of that deity that the Lord gave her and uh, very austere like that. So it was, uh, yeah, that's a little bit about his life. We also know that when Lord Chaitanya was married to her, many times he would invite some of his um, associates to come to lunch at his home. And Vishnu Priya would cook wonderful prasadam for everybody. Sometimes Lord Chaitanya would bring 20 people to the home and she would prepare a meal for everyone. So these are some of the sweet stories of Lord Chaitanya's marriage. And then there's some dialogue between Vishnu Priya and Sachi Mata that is also mentioned, I believe, in Chait Chaitanya Bhagwan. So there's not a lot about his married life, but those of you who like weddings, <laughs> you can enjoy reading about Lord Chaitanya's wedding. It's quite, it's quite uh, opulent, the wedding. The, the wedding was, it said it looked like it took place in Vaikuntha with all the opulence. Thousands of people came to the wedding. <laughs> Thank you, Maharaj. It's very much known in Vedic society, at least in Indian culture, to make the wedding of one's daughter one of the most important events in one's life. Everyone knows that people will spend like their whole fortune. I, I, was, I was with one lady. She was very wealthy. She was uh, extremely wealthy. <laughs> and uh, she uh, was getting her daughter married. And uh, this was in the UK. It wasn't in London, but it was in another place in the UK. And uh, she was telling me, she told us all that she, she wasn't available for a little while coming to the temple because she was involved with wedding affairs of her daughter. She spent four million pounds on the wedding. Four million pounds just on the wedding. <laughs> now you can imagine. And most of the money, of course, a lot of it went to invite people all around the world. She paid all the air tickets of everybody to come from different places around the world, mostly from India to come and be part of the wedding. But then again, it was a grand celebration. But Prabhupada also mentioned it's in one lecture how 
her family will save like a lot of their earnings let's put it aside for their daughter's wedding and then they will spend everything for the wedding that's the father's uh, a gift to the daughter because now the daughter is leaving and that is called reen reen it's like it's called it's another word for dowry it means the the gifts and the services that the father gives and he also gives a substance of money to the daughter when she's married to get her started in her married life Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances, all glories to Srila Prabhupada and all glories to you. Um, Guru Maharaj, uh, yesterday in our Chaitanya Charitamrita class, we were talking about, uh, it, this was the chapter on um, Sri Advaita Acharya and, and this idea that service was so high um, that that uh, like Prahlad Maharaj and, and others, they would just um, wish to serve the Lord. They didn't wish for anything else. They didn't wish for any kind of um, impersonal liberation, They uh, impersonal, um, yeah, or any type of liberation whatsoever. They just, all they're, they're, they wished for was, um, to serve the Lord's lotus feet. Like this is the highest uh, thing we could do as, as Vaishnavas would be to have this quality or to have this attitude of service. Where does this, we were just started talking about the root. I wanted to know where does this come from? In, in um, yeah, what is the root? of this idea of the quality of service. It's in the soul. Mm -hmm. It's the soul's innate nature. It's natural and it's the expression of the ultimate principle of happiness for the soul. Mm -hmm. In the material sense, it's the opposite. To be served is seen as someone who has achieved success, those who can have servants. But to be a servant, and Prabhupada talks about this many times. Gopi Bharti Pate Kamalayor Dasa Dasa Anadas. Lord Chaitanya didn't aspire for anything to be, but to become the servant of the servant of the damsel, servant of the damsels of Rajesh. But then Prabhupada said, the more you are a servant, the higher you are. He said, one should be, one should be das, das, anudas, 100 times removed. In other words, the farther down the line you are in the mood of service, the greater you are, the greater quality you are. So this is Vaishnav culture, but it's the nature of the soul. The soul simply finds its ultimate expression of happiness in serving the devotees and serving the Lord. One who is on that platform, they don't want anything because everything is there in that service. Mm -hmm. Complete love, complete knowledge, complete satisfaction, everything is there. So that's that's our culture, the, cult, the culture of Seva, to want to serve. We do that, we do that as a duty in our relationships in this world and sometimes we even enjoy that, even on the material platform. 
uh, I'll give you some mundane statistics. Um, there was a survey taking in the United States of America, one of these Gallup polls, where they wanted to find out what is the nature and the activities of people who are actually happy. The happiest people, what makes them happy? And this is a mundane program done by secular society. And the conclusion was that those who are most happy, they are all they're, they are busy serving others. <laughs> no, you see that. There's people who, even in a material sense, because it's a perverted reflection of our actual nature, when it's when it's when it's directed towards material energy, it's simply a reflection of our real nature and of the service to the Lord. But even in the material world, people get some satisfaction out of serving others. But in this on the spiritual plan, platform, the highest expression of happiness is manifested when one becomes fixed. I say fixed because it's important to understand that. Fixed in the mood of service to the devotees and to the Lord. So those, those who actually are on that platform, their mood is service at every moment. How to serve in every single moment that is their mood they look for that then just like this might sound a little off but just like we talk about not not saying thank you where does that come from the thank you principle is really something that has manifested in western societies in original Vedic culture, there was no such thing as people saying thank you. Because when someone did something for you, the person who did it was the person who benefited. So when you say thank you, you're breaking the intimacy of that relationship. So I've seen and heard where people who are, say thank you to somebody, the other person becomes unhappy why? I just want to serve you. And that's my happiness. Why are you saying thank you? You're, making, you're putting our relationship in a very, what we say, ordinary way, a mundane way. That's Vedic culture. Of course, we've lost that completely. And now, not to say thank you seems to be uh, something that is, when we impolite or insensitive, or unattentive, <laughs> but that's very, when you go back to the original Vedic, even in India now, people say thank you all around the world. But the original Vedic culture was, I'm serving. My happiness is to serve. So there's no, no need to, to, you know, say anything to, you know, like that. I'm happy just to serve you. That's my happiness. And that's genuine. Just like birthdays. <laughs> Here's another example. Western society, you get a birthday. What happens? You get all kinds of presents. People say, oh, happy birthday. Here's this. Here's another pair of socks you can add to your drawer. You know, so they give you all kinds of presents and you're feeling good. But in Vedic culture, when it was your birthday, you would give everybody presents. That's the actual etiquette. It's my birthday, and then therefore I'm ha I'm I'm celebrating my birthday by giving everybody I know a gift. So that's Vedic that's Vedic culture. Is this? Uh, we were talking also on the level of. Um, I know in material in the material world, this would be probably. I was thinking it came from the feminine aspect. 
you know, but in spiritual, in the spiritual world, this is from the Hladini Shakti, correct? This, this idea of service and Srimati Radharani? It's everybody's nature. Look at Krishna. Krishna likes to serve. Why did he become Lord Chaitanya? So he can be in the mood of service. God likes to serve more than anybody. <laughs> he's always serving. Even from the position of being God, he's serving everyone. Now the principle of service is the highest principle of existence. It's natural, it's your nature. It's the soul's essence. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Guru Maharaj. Yeah, practice it. <laughs> and you'll always be happy if you're in that mood. You'll never have problems. You'll never be unhappy if you're always in the mood of service. Very you true. may receive service because other people like to give service too. But that's not your mood is to think how can i be served you're thinking how can i serve yes Maharaj. when we start coming to that we start coming to our to our we come we're coming to our real heart that's now we're entering into our heart now love means to serve <laughs> As there's no other definition for love other than what we say, pleasing service. That's what love is about. If you want to show your love for someone, serve them in a pleasing way. That's love. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, dear. Guru Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Um, devotees, anybody have any more questions or comments? Um, Guru Maharaj, we are past one hour, Guru Maharaj. Um, okay, so we'll stop here. And tom uh, tomorrow, I think it's Friday, so we have to do our call in connection with the Charlotte devotees. So tomorrow's, tomorrow's verse, if you want to look at it ahead of time, is fifth canto, first Chapter verses 20 and 21 will be tomorrow's class. It's a joint session with the Charlotte devotees. Okay, thank you very much. Glories to Shri Thank you very much, Maharaj. What a very enlightening class today. Thank you so much. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, Guru Maharaj. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai, Guru Maharaj Ki Jai, all glories to the assembled devotees. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Yeah, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you so much. Hare Krishna. Thank you so much, Guru Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Thank you very much, Guru Maharaj.